about this. this. Yep. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, today we've got Ben Claremont, who is a portfolio manager and analyst at Cove Street Capital, a value investment firm. And Ben has got a presentation that he's going to share with you today. I want you to turn on your cameras, introduce yourselves to Ben, just say hello. And uh, also, um, what I was going to say is this is an interactive session. So, you know, if you guys have questions, be sure and ask them. Um, you know, I've looked over Ben's presentation. I thought it was great. A uh, lot of things I actually employed when I was, you know, working in the industry uh, as well in terms of the way he looks at things. So um, without further ado, um, Ben, the floor is all yours. Great. Um, well, um, Professor Ko, uh, Professor Kim, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm hoping this is going to be an interesting and valuable conversation. I want it to be interactive. So we will leave time for Q&A at the end, but please, and, and I will pause at, at certain um, intervals to see if people have questions, but feel free to raise your hand if anything strikes you immediately. Uh, I'm notorious for having a good thought and maybe even mid-sentence for getting it. So um, I, I, I appreciate if, um, you know, if you, if you have a good thought, feel free to, free to, feel free to share it. Um, I am going to share my screen. And so let's just make sure this works. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, they look great. Okay. Great. Uh, so the, uh, the title of this presentation is Triangulating Value and Incorporating ESG. Uh, prof um, Professor Ko and I talked a little bit about um, topics that would be interesting and valuable for you guys. And so this is what we came up with. Um, here's our, we are actually going to be discussing some ideas, not in depth, but uh, in terms of using examples to drive home the valuation techniques. It, there's no substitute for, for actually looking at true, real life um examples that we use at, at cove street but you should you should read the self safe harbor and recognize that this is not recommend these are there is no recommendation to purchase these securities uh, embedded in this presentation um so i always like to start with with an overview just so you know where we're headed um i'm going to start a little bit uh talking about myself and my history because it, it i took a little bit of a circuitous path to the buy side um and i think my experience can be instructive for someone who is interested in investment management and doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to have a get a job on the buy side day one. Um, and so I would encourage you to look at my story and, and recognize that through there are elements of my success that 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 uh, well, I mean, relative success, at least in terms of being happy uh, in the career I chose. But, um, you know, there, there are elements to that, that that you can replicate on your own. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Cove Street and our investment process. I think it's always helpful to have some context. Um, I'm going to throw some slides at you regarding, um, you know, our valuation framework, but it also helps to put that in context with what, what we look for in companies and, 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 and our process. Um, and then we're going to do a, a brief dive into different uh, valuation methodologies that we use, um, along with the aforementioned company examples. Uh, and we're going to cl the close that section with the discussion of decision making and, and how we incorporate ESG and then some key takeaways and then finish with Q&A. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, there's, there's more uh, on the next page, but um, this is, feel free to, to peruse the, the bio, but, but it's probably a little more. Uh, this is just what's on our website, but probably a little more instructive to go to the next slide. And I'm going to start from the beginning um, because I really believe that diversity of experience has the opportunity to make you a, a better investor. And, and that that's through all walks of life. So um, I grew up in Arizona. Um, my dad's a writer. My mother was a hypnotherapist. Um, as you can see, neither of them, you know, were early Berkshire investors. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have Buffett's letters next to my crib. Um, so, you know, I, I do know people who started, you know, whatever investing when they were nine years old and, you know, read all of Buffett's letter by, by 14. That wasn't me. Um, I, I literally grew up as far away from Wall Street as you can possibly imagine. Um, I actually grew up about, I don't know, a mile from the Mexican border. 
Um, and so very multicultural experience, um, you know, kind of very different from, from a, a, you know, the experience a lot of people have um, growing up in the US because uh, I was, you know, was very integrated with Mexican culture. Um, and I really straddled two worlds in the sense that, you know, for during, during the, the most of the year I was, I was living in a border town and the rest of the time I was uh, <laughs> walking the streets of the, the Bronx because um, my family's in the commercial real estate business and that's where our properties are. Um, so two very different ways of looking at the world and experiences, but I do think a lot of it was helpful um, in forming my worldview. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, be able to attend the Wharton School at, U at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, my focus, as you can imagine, given the family business, was on real estate. Um, so I didn't, I didn't start reading Buffett's letters at 14, but I did think that I was going to be a real estate investor and, and, and professional at, at 14. Um, it was kind of decided pretty early on in my life that I was going to go into the family business. Um, and, you know, this is hopefully going to be instructive for you guys is that, you know, I kind of had a myopic view of college get in, get out, right? Like I already had a job. I didn't need to, I didn't, I didn't feel like I ne needed to network, probably didn't take um, ad advantage of the educational opportunities that were surrounded me. It was more of a means to an end. Um, and so in hindsight, I would have been a lot more focused on, on finance and accounting than I was. I, I spent most of my time thinking about real estate. Um, and so I would encourage you, this is, you know, I'm, I just turned 40. I know that sounds ancient to you guys, but it's actually pretty young for people in the investment management industry. Um, you know, take advantage of the classes and the opportunities outside of your core competency. Learn as much as you can. Take take classes outside of your your discipline. Learn about you know economics and sociology and anthropology and psychology because investing is as much about psychology as anything else. So expand your horizons while you're in school. It is the best opportunity you have to learn. Um, the rest of your life, you will be jealous of, of, of the opportunity that other people, of, of young people have of being able to take classes on any subject you can imagine. Um, so from, from college, I worked in the family real estate business for five years. Um, I, I, you know, you, you can read the slide, working for your family is quote unquote interesting. Um, working for your family presents a whole host of opportunities and challenges. Um, so it, that was mostly a negative, I would say, in, in, in my view. Um, I also didn't really love the property management business. Um, you know, it's, it's I, I equate managing properties to, to being a firefighter. It's just literally these, the buildings are always under pressure of some kind, whether it's snowing or it's raining or it's flooding, it's, you know, it, it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, and it was in the midst of that, that uh, a friend of mine who I was living with handed me a copy of Ben Graham's Intelligent Investor. And it really changed my life. Um, I read that book and I said, um, I was a value investor before I knew what a value investor was. Um, I want to do this for a living. I think I'd be good at this. Um, and so, um, you know, I took a leap of faith, left the family business to try to get a job on the buy side. I was really lucky that uh, another Penn grad uh, who had left Goldman Sachs was starting up a hedge fund. This is in 2007. Uh, in, in hindsight, not an incredible time to join the industry because we were kind of 18 months or less away from the, the, the peak of the financial crisis. But it was my foot in the door. And I'll always tell, um, you know, students and anybody interested in investment management, that first buy side job is really hard to get, but once you get it, it's a foot in the door um, and you, you are kind of blessed um, in a way. And, and it helps you whatever, whatever way you want to go from there on the buy side, it helps to get that first one. Um, so if you ever do have that opportunity, feel lucky, um, even if it's not the exact firm that, you, that you'd hope for. Um, so financial crisis came. Uh, it was a in very instructive period. It was a great learning experience. Um, not a lot of fun, um, to, to be watching the markets be so volatile and up and down. And, um, you know, it, it, the, the firm I was with, um, didn't make it, it didn't necessarily fold, but the, when there was no way to raise money in 2008, 09, um, in a, at a hedge fund. So I was kind of looking around at what I, what I should do next. Um, and I really felt like I needed, uh, more of an experience in, in accounting and finance, um, because, you know, going back to the things that I missed in college, and so I came to UCLA. Uh, that's what that's when I got to LA in 2009. Um, UCLA Anderson um, doesn't is not 
as an okay investment program. Um, I think the what's best about the program at Anderson is the student investment fund, uh, similar to the to, to what you guys have at, at Fullerton. Um, the student student investment fund is really the only oasis where within Anderson where you can talk about actual investing. Um, I also co-founded the Anderson Investment Association. It, we, Anderson didn't actually have an investing or organization, which is just crazy to me. It was, they had you know we had a general finance organization. Um, uh, but no Anderson Investment Association. So uh, we co-founded that, which I believe still exists. Um, and I, I, I was lucky enough to get an internship with a, with a fund um, in dirt between my, 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 um, my two years of business school. Um, so this is a part of my story that, make, that kind of deviates and makes me a little unique. Um, I started an investment blog back, way back in 2009 called The Inoculated Investor. Um, it was really just to stay in the game while I was in business school. I wanted to connect with people um, and I wanted to make sure that um, I was still engaged with investing, even, even though business school is pretty all encompassing. Um, I made the annual track to Omaha every year um, and to, to go to the Berkshire meeting. And the blog really was, I launched the blog uh, with notes um, from the 2009 Berkshire meeting. Uh, I made the crazy decision that I try to take down every word that that Munger and Buffett said, and this was pre. This was like in these days you can stream it. It wasn't streamed, so there, the only way you could know what happened was if someone took notes. Um, and for the first couple of years, I actually think I took them by hand, and then I smartened up and and, and used a used a, a laptop. But it's um, for anyone who hasn't been to the Berkshire meeting, it's seven seven hours, um, and so you can imagine that it is a labor of love. It is you know your hand your arms, every, your whole body hurts after typing for that long. Um, but it really was unique content. Um, and so that was, that was how I stayed in the game. And that's how I made a lot of connections. Um, so, you know, I always tell people that part of my history is not going to necessarily be replicable, but, you know, I, I'll, but you'll see, you know, under the keys to success, you know, do something that others are not willing to do. It's a really good way to stand out from your peers. Um, and uh, so the, the long story short is that our, our founder, Jeff Bronchick, um, discovered me through the blog um, in, in, in Kelly was asking me about luck versus skill. Um, a guy who I didn't even know um, saw that I was looking for a job, knew my blog and recommended me to my boss. He had actually already decided to hire somebody else. And then he met me and he changed his mind. Um, so that's a lot of luck. Um, but you can create your own luck by doing things that other people aren't willing to do. Um, and the rest is history. I've been at Cope Street almost 10 years, which feels like a really long time. Um, I'm now the uh, co-PM on our small cap plus strategy, which is our smid cap strategy. Um, you can find me, you know, all over the internet these days um, on, on a number of podcasts. Um, it's, a, it's a medium that I really enjoy. We really like going deep into ideas. Um, I believe you guys listened to the Lumen podcast that we did. Um, so happy to happy to chat about that also, but, um, you know, it's, it's been a great 10 years and I've learned an enormous amount, but it's just, but, but my story, as you can see, is, this is not a direct path. I didn't, I didn't go to Wharton and then, then go work at Goldman and then go work at a hedge fund like that. I didn't, I didn't take that path, but so I hope it's instructive to you guys that like, if you want to do this, you know, don't think that there is one linear path to get there, you know, find your own way. First of all, do something that 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 you feel strongly about, and that not necessarily, you know, I I don't like the advice. Do something that you love. I mean, there's there's a lot of trade offs associated with any any job, but but do something as as, as Buffett would say, would you know, allows you to tap dance to work. Um, so the keys to to the success that I've had, in all honesty, um, persistence. I just, you know, I, I really wanted something. I didn't quit. I didn't stop. Um, um, and I, I really worked hard to get um, to network and to get my name out there and to try to distinguish myself. I just was willing to do things that others weren't willing to do. You know, every year, maybe two or three people who went to the Berkshire meeting were willing to take notes. And and that was it out of the thousands who go there. And so that's just, I think it just shows that if you do have unique content or unique insight, it can be really valuable. Um, I think you should love the process of investing. It's a lot of work. It's hard uh, psychologically. Um, it is enormously frustrating at times. And so unless you love it, I don't, and, and I don't think you're gonna, I don't think you're gonna make it. Um, and then, and then lastly, find, find a way to distinguish yourself, right? Whether that's your background or your insights, find whatever it is that you, that you know, um, really well, 
regardless of whether you're, you know, whether you're an expert on everything, find something that you're an expert in, in a way that so you can distinguish yourself. Um, so that's me. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Cove Street. Um, we're, uh, we're based in El Segundo. We're hundred percent employee owned. We have about 750 under management. Um, we run concentrated strategies in small and SMID. Um, in small cap, that's 30 to 39 stocks. In SMID, that's uh, 20 to 29 stocks. So we run pretty concentrated. We do a lot of work um, on our ideas. Our holding periods are pretty long um, you know, as a result. Um, we have three pillars, our investment process, business value and people. Um, everything, everything we do is through that lens and all the qualitative and quantitative search always comes back to business value and people. Um, you can see we have a four, four uh, member investment team, Jeff's our founder, and then three analysts. And I'm also, I'm an analyst and a portfolio manager. Um, if you're interested in Coast Street at all, uh, please go to coastreetcapital.com. We have an, a lot of content, writings, podcasts, interviews. Like if you're interested in us, like, you know, we're out there and, and, and happy to, we're, we're, we're not, we're not, you know, some opaque hedge fund. Like you can, you can know what we're thinking and doing. Uh, so our philosophy, just classic fundamental research-driven value investing. Uh, so do a lot of work, um, try to try to be a contrarian, try to find a bunch of information that is outside of what other people are thinking about and talking about. And when you find a good idea, concentrate on it. Um, in, in, in Small Cap Plus, we have a 10% position. Um, that's our Smith strategy, sorry. We have two 7.5% positions. So, you know, that's... 25% you know, of our portfolio in three names is, is, is pretty concentrated. Um, think and act long-term. This may sound crazy to you, but having a three to five year time horizon can be a competitive advantage because so many other people are thinking about next week or, or next quarter. And there are opportunities to take advantage of people's other short-sightedness. Um, take advantage of the mathematics of compounding. So invest in a good business, let it compound. Don't, don't sell it to pay taxes. Um, don't sell it when it gets to fair value because you know you think it's quote unquote expensive now. You know, if you have a true compounder, let it stay in your portfolio and let it, you know, let it become a bigger position over time. Um, because you know, there aren't that many great ideas that you'll have in your career. And if you have a true compounder, let it grow. Um, and less is more, it's just a it's it's a philosophy for everything we do. Fewer stocks, um, you know, uh Low, keep keep your asset base small because in small and mid cap you don't have an unlimited capacity to to take in money. So keep yourself small so you can be nimble. Um, focus on fewer companies. Don't don't look at the entire universe. Narrow it down to a bunch of really good companies that you'd like to own. And so these are this is kind of these are the questions that I ask myself. My, each one of my teammates might have a slightly different version of these, but these are the three that I focus on um, when looking at a new idea. Is this a high return company that is getting more valuable every day? Um, is this a company run by honest people um, who understand capital allocation? And then is a stock undervalued based on a conservative assumptions about the future? Getting back to business value people. But for me, it's I want to invest in companies that are getting more valuable every day. Um, and and it's, it's I think where you get into trouble um, as a value investor is when you, you're, you have something that's unequivocally not getting more valuable. Um, and that means you have to be right and you know, you have to be right in a short period of time. And I think that can be dangerous. Um, uh, quickly on our investment process. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on generating ideas. We run screens, we screen for good businesses and, and, and cheap stocks. We screen for behavioral anom anomalies and companies in transition. So that means, you know, we look at spinoffs, we look at, uh, you know, busted IPOs. We look at things coming out of bankruptcy. We're just looking for things that are off the beaten track. Um, and the truth is we also have a, you know, we have a Jeff, our founder has been in the business for 35 years and I'm, you know, I'm going on almost 15 years now. So we have a lot of experience and, 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 and contacts and, uh, um, that help us, uh, you know, both source and, and, and do validation of, of, of new ideas. Um, our second stage is a qualify stage. We have a cap a, you know, quote unquote proprietary, uh, spreadsheet, um, that is basically just the, uh, the, the, the template for, for a model. So you plug in the ticker, it populates your cap IQ. And, it, and really what we're trying to figure out in this, in this qualify stage is what, what, what kind of company is it? Is it a Buffett stock, which is a good business trading at a reasonable price, or it is a Graham stock, which is a cheap security that, that provides a large enough margin of safety. 
Um, and so if it gets to the, the, the first two phases, uh, we go into the deep dive, which I think is the most unique part of our process. Um, we team tackle um, every idea. So we're all generalists and every idea has two longs and one short. Um, we we pre-assign a short to every idea to be the devil's advocate. This person's job is to quote unquote, kill the idea, right? Find reasons why we shouldn't invest. Our process by in general is designed to limit activity. As I said, less is more. So that's, you know, fewer stocks every year, you know, it don't, don't, you know, we, we don't want that many pro new ideas getting through um, to the final stages. We really want to filter out ideas that don't make the cut in, in at the very beginning, which is where we, where we, we would do the deep dive and the short would probably say we should know this. And, and that person would have a really compelling reason why we shouldn't. Um, we also triangulate intrinsic value, which is going to be a, which is why this is highlighted here. It's going to be a topic of conversation in, 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 the, in the rest of this presentation. Um, that includes DCF, so some of the parts, multiples analysis. We'll get into that more. Um, but really what we're trying to do is, is trying to marry a qualitative assessment of the company, which is, does it have a sustainable competitive advantage? Does it have moat? Is it getting more valuable every day? What does the competition look like? with a more quantitative uh, analysis, which is the DCF, SOTP and multiples analysis. Um, and we don't do macro, we're not macro investors, um, but we do have a little bit of a macro overlay on an idea. And so for every company, we look at the risk factors, whether it's climate change, political risks, economic risks, social risks or technological risks, like what could make us lose money? Um, and, and so we, we don't, we're not trying to you know, try to forecast interest rates or um, what the dollar is going to do. But we do want to look from a security specific basis on a security specific basis. What are the risks there? And then stage four is our decision. Um, every analyst um, who worked on the idea fills out what's called our decision process uh, spreadsheet. And, um, you know, is it, do we do a full or half position? Do you have a sufficient margin of safety? Um, and, and really what, what we're trying to do is e even when you buy it, you want to establish your sell discipline. And so what do I mean by that? If you determined if it's a Buffett stock, if it gets to fair value, you're likely to hold it because it's a compounder and it's getting more valuable every day. However, if you, if you determine that it's a gram stock, um, you're likely to sell it because it's more of a point to point, take advantage of mean reversion, but don't fall in love with the business. Um, so let me, um. Let me stop there, and I wanna um, I wanna first ask a question, and I would love for a volunteer to you know just anybody who listened to the Lumen podcast, uh, anybody have any questions or insights or thoughts or anything that that struck you about that um, you know about that uh, discussion. Don't all raise your hands at once. All right, if, if, if no one, well, we, we'll, there'll be other uh, um, chances to chime in. Um, so let me, let me just move to the next slide then. So this is, this is a slide uh, inspired by uh, Bill Simon, um, who, who runs the Grant, Ben Graham Value Investing Program at UCLA. He always tells me, you have to give people context. You have to explain why the topic of the presentation is really important. Um, and so this is a slide on why valuation is really important to you as, a, as an investor. Um, so first of all, as an investor, you know, unless you're an activist investor, you can't really control that much because what you're doing is you're buying a, sh a minority share in a business and you're probably not going to have a lot of say on, on the direction of the business. So really what you can control is the quality of your due diligence process um, and then the price you pay. So valuation goes into that you can control the price you pay and the valuation you're willing to accept. Um, and so of, and, and any academic research you read is gonna tell you that valuation really matters when it comes to future returns. So um, if, if, it, if that's what you can control and it really matters, then that would suggest to you that it's pretty important um, when you're thinking about either new or existing idea. Um, I also think it's a core skill of being an equity analyst, right? If you, being a good qualitative analyst is, is huge, right? Because I think understanding businesses is as important, if not more important than being able to value companies, but you, but you have to be both, 
right? So I just think of everything as qualitative and quantitative, and the quantitative side is 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 parent is is, is important, um, you know, for anybody to be able to master if you're going to be able to pick stocks. And then I also think, especially when it comes to a DCF, you know, people would probably say that the, that our industry, you know, there's just not a lot of room for creativity. But I look at it differently. I look at it at a DCF um, and, and structuring you know, how you're going to model a company and the way you make assumptions and projections. I think that is a creative process because what you're doing is you're incorporating a bunch of qualitative information and making quantitative assumptions. And uh, I'll use the analogy I always use and is that, you know, we look at investing as kind of like painting a mosaic. And every bit of information you get on the company, whether it's about management or about the business or about the competition, you're putting a dot on that canvas. Um, and then what you're doing is you're hoping that you have enough dots on that canvas that you can step back one and say, look, it's a Picasso um, after a point. And so um, that's the creativity side. And, and you get to do that with your modeling because you're gonna, you're gonna use all of those data points that you're getting qualitatively and you're gonna employ them in the model. Um, so I, I, you know, I would push back on anyone who says that, you know, we're just a bunch of, of ro you know, robots and spreadsheet monkeys. Like, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of, of creativity that goes into that process. And then, you know, lastly, building consistency is a key, a, a key to a good process, right? W whether that's a qualitative assessment or quantitative assessment, you need to build consistency in your modeling, right? Like you can't be all over the place in terms of the way that you, you, you value companies and you need to use the same metrics as you're, you know, or as many metrics as you can. And so I, I look at this as, as, as a, you know, valuation is part of a consistent process. Um, so let's, um, let me stop there. Any, um, any questions? about either my background or Cove Street or yeah, let's just start there. Any, let's, uh, any questions on that? I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, thanks again. Yeah, I have a question about when you have like um, your valuation process when you have the two longs and one short, is there someone in the middle that decides what argument is stronger? Is that like all a team discussion? And then um, the second part of that question would be, is do you guys kind of hope that the short is usually right? Because I, I, that's what I felt like you were trying to get across. So these are good questions. So it's, it's not so formulaic that there's, there needs to be someone, you know, where we, some, some process where we vote on who's stronger. I, I really want you to think of this as an iterative process where the short brings up ideas um, about why we shouldn't own it, um, or why it's too expensive, or why the business isn't getting more valuable every day. And what it does is it causes the longs to do more work. And if at the end of the day, it causes them to do work that confirms the shorts position, then there's, there's no need to vote, right? It becomes very clear that this is not something we should invest in. So, you know, it, it's not, not so so structured that you know we have to do these very formulaic things it's more like have a discussion and be willing to continue to do work until you can answer all the questions um and then i think the to, to answer the second question about what is the point of the short and 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 do, are you are you really hoping that the short is right i mean i don't know if you're hoping that the short is right you're 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 looking for good ideas you're looking for 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 new under underfollowed, underappreciated, underloved securities that that can make money for your investors. So um, it's not that you want the short to be right, but what you want to do is you want to have a number of roadblocks within the process set up to um, kind of reduce the amount of activity you have um, and have a really high hurdle for every new investment. And so. I enjoy being the short because even if it's a great company and I think the valuation is good and, and, and we should own it, it's still a great intellectual exercise to A, argue against your, um, your colleagues, but also if you like it, argue against yourself, right? Be able to take the other side of any investment. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I think it's a great part of our process um, th that that it, what it does more than anything else is it flushes out um, questions that we have to continue to answer. Um, and if we can't get comfortable with those at the end, then we'll just we'll, we'll either pass and say, yes, we would own this, but at a different price or just pass completely and say, you know, this is not something we could own given either management or the business. Good question, though. Got it. Thank you very much. I, I had a quick question. Just wanted sure. to say thank you again for uh, showing up and uh, presenting to us today. Um, what would you say is kind of the expected turnaround time or maybe average turnaround time for your investment recommendations and kind of like the time allocated and spent with uh, the long for short researchers? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it depends. And that's, you know, that's the answer a lot of times in investing. There's a, there's, it's not black or white, it's nuanced. So if it's something in industry that we're familiar with or a company that we've looked up in the past, um, you can get up to speed in a week or two weeks and could make an investment decision. But if it's an industry that we've never spent time in, I mean, I always use the example of the mattress industry. There's a company called Sleep Number that's in the mattress industry that it really took me three years of following that company to get comfortable with investing in. And we finally did, um, and we sold it way too early. Um, but it, it turned out to be a successful investment. Um, but it really took three years of trying to understand the management, understand the end markets, understand the growth opportunity. So the range can vary. Um, and so it's, let me, let me put it this way my general sense of, of how to be a good investor is to find a bunch of businesses that you'd like to invest in, do the work, even if they're not actionable at the moment, whether it's due to valuation or for some other reason, and then have them on a wish list or a watch list so that when the vicissitudes of the market hand you opportunities and, 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 and the companies just for whatever reason, have a hiccup or people don't like it for you know a short period of time, you have the ability to act. So um, be diligent in your initial research, be thoughtful and long-term focused and do a lot of work to understand really what it is, but then be in position where if the price ever crosses you know, where you want to own it, that you can act quickly. Um, and then I would say the, the lead analyst is always a person who does the most work. And the other people, the, the second long and then the short are kind of complementary. And so we all do a fair amount of work, but it's always a lead who's driving it. And the lead's always gonna have the most information. Um, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't spend a week looking at a company on the short side. Thank you. And just a quick follow-up question. I'm, I'm really curious, what industries have you found have kind of like the, taken the longest time to truly research and understand? Yeah, um, the mat mattress industry notwithstanding, um, you know, consumer products are usually pretty easy. You, you, you either, a third party or you manufacture it and, and you either retail it or wholesale it to somebody else, right? It's, those businesses are really easy to understand. You know, the mattresses is interesting because there's only two publicly traded companies. And so it's not like you have a lot of comps to look at or a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, there's just not a lot of people following that industry. But I would say anything that's heavily regulated, um, kind of like healthcare, for example, you know, anything that it requires that has a bunch of like regulation, pricing issues when it comes to you know what the government does or what the government won't doesn't do, plus the FDA approving things, that just takes a long time to get well versed in how the whole process works, how the payer systems work. Um, you know, how do you, how do FDA, how do FDA trials work? All of that stuff I think takes a long time. So the more regulated it is and the more science or technology based it is, I think it takes a little longer. Great. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. So let, let me, so there'll be more time for Q and A at the end. Those are good questions. Uh, thank you for jumping in. Um, so let's just, um, we, we, we did a little overview of the, of the, of the topics we were going to cover, but let's just drill down a little bit. Um, in terms of the investing topics we're going to cover, um, how Cove Street values companies, um, how valuation impacts uh, uh, investment decisions and position sizing, and then um, incorporating ESG into decision making. So these are our four primary valuation techniques. So DCF, of course, um, historical multiples analysis, some of the parts, 
private market value. Um, we'll discuss each of those in depth. But uh, the main takeaway from the, you know, as you're looking at this list is, is triangulate. So, so you want multiple metrics that suggest that a stock is trading below its intrinsic value. Um, and the reason that's important is because, you know, there are plenty of times where, you know, it could be cheap on historical multiples, but based on similar assumptions, the DCF does not make it look cheap or the sum of the parts looks really cheap, but for some reason, you know, um, you know, the, the, the historical multiples looks expensive or it's not corresponding. And, and so I think to have a proper margin of safety and to make sure that you are, your assumptions are, are, are not kind of inconsistent, you want to triangulate and you want multiple of these, of, of these techniques to say this stock is undervalued. And, and I, I say this kind of facetiously, but it's something to really consider as a young investor is that there's no bell that goes off when, when you hit a stock's intrinsic value, right? There's no, no one tells you that you got it right, right? You need to have, you need to have multiple techniques saying that it's undervalued. Um, you probably have a range of assumptions and a base case and maybe an upside and a downside case. What you're really focused on is margin of safety. Um, but, you know, th th this is not, I want, you, I want you to leave this discussion re recognizing that this is not an, an exact science. There is as much art getting to the creativity part. There's as much art as science to this. And so what you want is you want as much evidence as possible to suggest that the stock is indeed cheap. Um, so the DCF, it is the foundation of any investment. I mean, either you believe that the value of, of any company is equal to the present value of its future cash flows, or you don't, right? And there are plenty of people on Wall Street who believe that you know a company is worth uh, you know uh, some kind of multiple on its on its earnings per share, right? The entire sell side is based on that premise, right? But they they have a shorter time horizon. Um, they you know they may do a DCF, but you rarely even see it being referenced. So um, you know we like to think differently, right? Like we're, we're looking at things, you know, we're looking at, at cash flows five and ten years out. We're thinking about uh, the business from a, a perspective of does the business have a competitive advantage? How big is the total addressable market? What do incremental returns on invested capital look like? Not just historical returns on invested capital. You know what? Um, what margins do, do they can they generate? Um, can they can do? Are there opportunities to enhance returns going forward? And then you know what are their avenues for capital allocation? Um, you know, the future is very difficult to discern. And so you always want to be humble and understand that it's, 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 you're, you're going to be wrong, right? Whatever you think is going to happen over the next five years, you're inevitably going to be wrong. So what you want to do is you want to be conservative um, because you, if you, if you bake in, and, and this, we'll talk about this in a second on, on the next slide, but if you bake in aggressive assumptions, and you're wrong, you're probably going to lose money. Um, but if you make in conservative assumptions and you're wrong um, because it's much better, then you're probably going to do really, really well. Because if it was cheap based on your numbers and it, and it, and and they hit their you know their aspirational numbers, you're probably going to make a lot of money. And, and remember, and this is you know you always see this, but garbage in, garbage out, which means that I, don't give me a stock. I promise you, based on the assumption on assumptions I can make, I will make it look expensive or cheap just based on those assumptions, right? You can do whether you're messing with the cost of capital, where you're messing with the growth rates or the margins. You can do anything you want. So you really want to be consistent in your assumptions. You want to and you want to be, um, you know, thoughtful about the way that you are, you know, in putting in growth numbers, putting in margin numbers. Th these are these are these these are, you know, these are this is the art of it. Right, that where you you need to be both consistent, future-looking, thoughtful, and conservative all at the same time. Um, and remember that multiples are 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 simply shorthands for a DCF. Um, so you know when anyone's talking about well, it's trading at this free cash flow multiple or 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 a DCF. Really, what you're doing is 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 you're just doing a, a kind of a back of the envelope DCF. Um, so. This is something that's a little unique about us. Um, we're very conservative in our DCFs. Um, we have a risk-free rate that's stuck at 5%. It is hard-coded. That has not changed regardless of where the 30-year went. 
Um, so we think of WAC um, a little differently than some other investors, I think. Um, for us, it's a minimum level of return that you would accept as an equity investor. So if the long-term stock markets in the U.S. has returned 6 or 7%, you know, you really want a, a whack for 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 a company, right? Where there's more risk than a market, you want the whack, you know, to 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 be greater than those market returns. Um, and you know, I think people have called us too conservative, uh, and um, you know, not that you know you 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 know there's safety in numbers here, but you know, I just we, I just listened to a podcast from Joel Greenblatt. Um, where he discussed this idea specifically, where he has the risk-free rate for him is, is 6% and it's stuck there, irrespective of where interest rates are. So I just thought that was like, a, you know, if, if don't take it from me, listen to Joel, he's been really successful. But, but the idea is that um, you shouldn't be sacrificing returns just because the interest rate environment has changed. And I will tell you, that has made us look foolish at periods of times when multiples are expanding, interest rates are low and you see extreme valuations, right? Because if people are underwriting things at a 4% 4, 4 whack and you're at eight, you know, you're gonna look, and, and, stocks, and the stocks are going up, right? You're gonna look kind of silly. But we think that having a consistent process that doesn't deviate based on what the Fed's doing is, is probably the right long-term strategy. Uh, we also build in zero terminal growth rates um, which I think is, which is pretty unique and conservative um, in, in conjunction with modest growth expectations over five to 10 years. Um, so just quickly, um, this is an example for, of Western Union, a company we own. Um, you guys are probably familiar with Western Union um, and what they do is, is it's, a, it's basically a money, a remittance business where people, people go to Western Union and they send money all over the world. Um, and so you can look at this. This is just a snapshot um, of, of, a, of a DCF that, that we use for, for Western Union. Um, you know, the stock's about 25 bucks and, you know, our DCF with an 8% WAC, um, you know, gets you almost 30 bucks. Um, but this is, this is what it looks like. And we have this sensitivity table here that um, allows you to say, well, what if growth is better than you think? Or what if, you know, what if growth is worse than you think? Or what is, or going the other way, what is implied by the current stock price? Um, and in this case, that you know, around twenty-five dollars, you know, the NOPAT growth, um, you know, is kind of negative two percent, right? So that would suggest to you that there's not particular, there's not a lot of, of love baked into this. So this this is, you know, there, we have this gigantic model with a lot of different inputs, but this is the output of our DCF. Um, historical multiples, um, and and I promise um, when I get through this the section on on, on valuation, I'm ha I'll, I'll stop and you can ask questions. But let me just get through the the the, the, the techniques. Um, this is really straightforward. So we use capital capital IQ to um, and we basically take the standard deviationized um, adjusted or standard deviation adjusted average multiples, which that means we just cut off the tails. Like you know if you know if 2009 is one tail and whatever 2019 is another where the multiple is really expensive in 2019 and um or or, or really cheap in 2019 and, and really and really expensive in 09 because the earnings were depressed we just cut those off and then we take the average um and so we do it for five and ten and fifteen years um and then you know you can see this this uh, chart here for western union these are the multiples. So over 15 years, it's traded about 8.2 8 times EBITDA. Um, it's about the same as the five-year numbers. And it's also traded you know, at very pedestrian 11 to 13 times earnings over that period of time. And so what we do is we apply that the chosen multiple to a three-year out EBITDA, um, you know, EPS and, and sales. Um, and, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like. Here's Western Union again. Um, so if you look at, you know, here's 2023, Here's uh, you know about 1.3 billion in EBITDA. Um, you will see here that I'm using a slightly higher multiple than the average, um, and that's because I think and and I almost never do this, um, but I really think the business has transitioned, and I think they've been through a very pe tough period of time that has depressed the multiple that then and that fog is lifting. Um, so this is a 20% return on invested capital global brand. Um, you know, I don't think nine and a half times EBITDA and 14 times, 15 times EPS is particularly aggressive. Um, but for sure, to make money from here, 
um, we're going to need for um, the multiple expand a, a little bit. And there have to be reasons as an analyst, the reasons why that's going to happen. Um, and one other thing to note here, and this is just our little special brand of valuation, um, Western Union is a massive cash generator. So over the next three years, um, this company is going to generate almost six dollars in cash on a on a twenty five dollars stock. So we add that back to the, or basically subtract that from the enterprise value to get our valuation. Um, some of the parts. Um, so this is really useful if a company has multiple segments. You find a public comp for each one of the segments. You apply those multiples to the various segments. Um, you can also use precedential transactions. So if you have a company with a segment where the largest competitors got bought, well, you know, that may be a, a, a decent uh, multiple to slap on to uh, the, the segment that, that you're, of, of the company that you're looking at. Um, and then what we do is we add a discount or premium based on the business quality versus the peers. So if, if let's just use that example where, you know, you have a segment of a business where the largest competitor just got bought and let's say it got bought for 10 times EBITDA, you know, is that, is, is the, is the segment that you're looking at better or, or worse on a qualitative basis? Are the returns higher? Is it, or what, what is growth profile? Does one have scale? Does the, the other one not have scale? So you, we add a, a premium or a discount depending on that. Um, I, I always say be very careful if there are no or few perfect comps, you, you know, if, if, if all you if all you have is, um, conglomerates that have similar segments, or some overlap, I think that can be kind of misleading and doesn't get you to a, a, a good number. Um, and then beware of inflated multiples, getting back to, you know, whatever, low interest rates, inflating multiples across the entire universe of stocks. Be really careful about using whatever current multiples, if they're three, four, or five turns higher than they were historically. Um, and so what you do is you sum up the various parts, you subtract the debt and you get the equity value. Um, and so this is this is a slide from actually from Lumen, uh, which is a company which is our largest position in small cap plus. Um, you know, it was a it was a company we did the podcast on, but this is from the company itself, um, where they were. This is when the stock was. I think they put this out. Stock was like eight or nine dollars, and they're saying if you put a five to six multiple on the CenturyLink business and you put a ten to twelve multiple on the Level Three business, you're getting twenty four to thirty five dollars on a stock that was sub ten. Right, so huge margin of safety, um, which is one of the reasons. All that we we still think all of this is true, but um, you know, but this is an example of of, of how you would do an SOTP. Um, you just don't usually see companies doing it. So, but I thought you know, for to be instructive, I thought I would include that. Um, and then you know, uh, I'll let me do private micro value, and then I'll stop and and pause for questions. Um, so really, the question is, what would this company be worth if it were sold today? Not three years out, not necessarily based on um, you know um, what are the segments trading for, but like what would be a fair multiple for the whole, whole company? So you can look at your precedential transactions. You can either apply those multiples to segments or the whole company. Again, you can add a discount or premium based on the business quality. Um, I also think you have to, if you're using you know precedential transactions or, or multiples, you just have to un or current multiples, you have to understand where you are in the cycle. And when deals were completed, because the company, you know, if 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 the most recent transaction was in 2014, you know, seven years later, I don't, you know, how instructive is that? You know, where have multiples trended? Has the business gotten better or worse? So it's it, it's an inexact science, just like all valuation, um, and and you have to be really careful, you know, if there aren't any good comps or or if multiples have been inflated or deflated recently. But um, as you're doing a private market analysis and you're trying to put a, a multiple on what someone would pay today, um, you know, th these are the things you need to remember. You know, margins. How do the margins compare to the peers? How do the returns compare to peers? How does the growth, po uh, growth profile compare to peers? How does geographic exposure change? Like if one company has a lot of exposure to emerging markets that are growing while the other one is 100% domestic and not growing that fast, you know, you could see different, different multiples. Um, you know, where the stock is traded can matter as well, right? For just It's historically true that chemical, you know, kind of uh, specialty chemical companies in the US get much higher multiples than specialty chemical companies that trade in Europe. It's two or three, 400, you know, 400 basis points of, of spread. And so where the stock is traded is important. Size and scale, um, you know, bigger, more scaled companies that have higher margins could get bigger multiples. Um, but on the flip side, there could be really big synergies uh, with a small company 
um, where they could wipe out all of their costs. And then, you know, what, a, what, what the seller multiple looks like and the buyer multiple could look really, really different based on those synergies. Um, and then who's a buyer? Is it a strategic who can extract a lot of synergies or is it a private equity acquirer who is, is, is going to use leverage to, to juice his returns and, and cut costs relative to using synergies? Um, so sorry, I went through that a little quickly, um, but let me pause there and, and let me know if you have any questions on any or all of those techniques. Yeah, Benjamin, uh, first off, I just want to thank you for taking your time with us today. Sure. Um, so I did have a question on the exit method, uh, DCF approach. So I, I covered software. So um, other companies, they'll have high growth and then they'll oh, gradually taper off um, as you approach the exit year. Yeah. Um, is there a way to look at like that exit multiple? Uh, just assuming that probably uh, lower as that like growth will slowly taper off kind of compared to like uh, where they're currently like trading at more so. Yeah, I mean, so we're value investors. And as I said, almost all of our assumptions are conservative. But if you have a, a software company that's satisfying the rule of 40 and growing really fast right now, um, you know, it's probably really conservative to have um, a terminal multiple that, that, that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't include a terminal growth rate. Um, so, you know, again, this is another critique of our process, which is legitimate that, you know, if you are investing in good business, you are going to undervalue it by not embedding some growth. Um, and so our, our, you know, I'll be frank with you, some, our DCFs are often, you know, look, look very pedestrian. Like you could, you could see the other, you could see the other valuation metrics looking very attractive for and saying a stock is cheap and our DCF because of our in, embedded conservatism um, makes it look fairly valued to even expensive. So, um, you know, I, I think if, if I were to adjust our process a little bit and say, where are there companies for which we should be um, adding some terminal growth just because of whatever the end markets or the NACE it, it's, or, or the, the trajectory and the TAM associated with a company. Um, you know, I think for something like software, we probably would because otherwise you'd never own anything in software right now. You could never, you could never justify the valuation, but let me be, but let me be remind you of something. Um, you know, no trees grow to the sky. Very few companies actually turn out to be Google and Amazon. Um, and competition, especially for generating high margins and growth, comes and it comes for you. So you have to be, you have to, to be able to underwrite aggressive growth in years five to ten, and then in, you know and, and 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 after that, you have to believe that there is a very strong moat, entrenched barriers to entry, um, and a competitive advantage that you really believe will be is, is, is can 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 survive ten plus years. There aren't that, you know, all of the crazy multiples we see in the market now, notwithstanding, there aren't that many companies that, that satisfy all of that. So um, again, the answer is it depends, but if you need to, if you need to, if, if the industry, given the trajectory of the, of, of the end markets, you know, suggests that you know some kind of terminal growth rate is is um is appropriate just be conservative does okay. that help yeah no that's very insightful thank you so much appreciate that yeah any other questions uh, uh when i i had a quick one kind of sure. uh, piggybacking off ryan's um, it's definitely a very interesting and i think uh, an accurate depiction of using that zero percent growth rate at a certain point at what time in the companies and is it kind of uh, industry specific that you would begin to apply that 0% growth rate after X time? So, um, so we model out the, here, let me just go to it. Um, so we model out these NOPAT numbers, the first five years, and then everything here flows back to six, this number here. So we don't, we don't specifically model these numbers. We say it's grown 
obviously they, they had a tough 2020. So 2021 looks like a good, a good year, but look, it's grown, you know, kind of one to two and a half percent for, for, for five years. What do we think the five to 10 year growth rate is, you know, we put 2%. I mean, that is, this is, this is no pat. This is not revenue, but this is no pat. I mean, this is, this is really conservative, right? Like, I mean, if, if, if I think this is a good company and that they've changed their trajectory, 2% would be um, a very pedestrian growth rate. But if I'm still getting almost $30 with an 8% whack um, on a $24, $25 stock, that's suggestive of a pretty nice margin of safety. Um, so I think we're very conservative with our year six through 10 multi, uh, growth rates. Um, you know, I think as an analyst, you just want to be really careful about just being very linear in your thinking and, and saying, hey, you know, it's growing really fast now. Let's just let's just drag, you know, 10 years over and say, if it's growing 12 percent now, it's what that, you know, that's going to be, you know, 11 percent in 10 years. There aren't that many companies that can do that. Um, and you have to think about the total addressable market as well. Right. Like the, 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 the just like the 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 common mistake that analysts, young analysts would specifically make is that if you, if something grows at 10% compounded for 10 years, that is an enormous amount of growth. And so you better have an industry that's growing a lot faster than that, because if not, there, this company is going to take up the total, the, the entire total addressable market. <laughs> and that's just not, you know, this is not Google search, right? There's only, there's only one Google search. Most businesses and industries, most industries are not winner take all. Right and comp and if someone else sees you growing that fast, competition is going to come. Um, and so, our general sense is be conservative in your in your six through ten um, growth um, growth numbers, because especially in the world today, given the speed of disruption and you know what technology has done to industries, you want to be very humble um, and conservative in terms of what you think something can do five years out, because you know, when I think about two, two, five years out from 2016 was, was 2021. And think about all the incredible things that have happened since then, whether politically, pandemic wise. I mean, again, getting to the point, your DCF is going to be wrong. <laughs> no one had COVID in their 2020 DCF. So approach it with humility approach it with conservatism um, and just remember that um, you know th that it is think of I, I like to think of world and base rates what is the base rate of success for any endeavor and so what that means is like if you look across an entire class of companies how many of them were able to grow 10 percent or more for, for a decade very few so if you're modeling that, you have to believe that there's something really special about this company, because my guess is the base rate of company out of a hundred, there's probably one or two that can actually do that. Uh, any other questions of valuation before we move on, kind of start wrapping up? We, we, we can do more Q&A um, in a minute anyway. Yeah, Ben, I just have one question. Um, sure. And I, I like the way that you describe the model as it's not a mathematical exercise. It's really a, a, an exercise in, in creativity and being able to, you know, formulate what your assumptions are. Um, so much is made of how models to really make any money, and, and the students just got through listening to Howard Marks on Thursday, um, so much of making money is really being different from the consensus. And you kind of described the number of ways that you're different. One is, you know, if you're by looking at contrarian out of favor stocks, that's one way of being different because obviously there's some disbelief in in those companies, those business models, how they're modeled. Another thing you mentioned that that was really good is this time horizon aspect where as because most investors are just focused on the near term quarter to quarter, they're not necessarily focused on things which could impact the company longer term. But in, in the case of, let's say, the Buffett type stocks where you have companies that are, like you said, creating value every day, compounding, how do you come up with like qualitative assessments that are different that you actually can factor into a model um, with the, without the idea of necessarily just saying, I'm going to go with the consensus because maybe the consensus starts to believe that it's a compounder too. So that, that would yeah. be my question. Yeah. 
tell you, I mean, it's, it is a very, very good question and a, and a, and a difficult thing um, to, to be a contrarian um, in a company that everybody loves. Um, and so, you know, here, here's what I've found in my, in my evolution as an investor, and we didn't really talk about this, but I think it's worth mentioning it here. Like I started my career as a Ben Graham oriented investor, cheap, cheap, cheap. I liked anything cheap. I didn't care about really the quality of the business. I didn't care about who was running it. I just wanted something that traded a low multiple of book or EBITDA or, or, EP, or EPS. Um, and, you know, over the last, I would say four or five years, I've really started to appreciate the, the Buffett style of investing, which is, you know, looking at compounders, um, understanding competitive advantages, investing in businesses with moats, finding businesses that are getting more valuable every day. Um, and so, but unfortunately for me, that revelation has co coincided with a period of time where the true Buffett's have just seen unbelievable multiple expansion, right? Honestly, things that used to trade kind of when we when we first started Code Street in 2011, things that used to trade at, you know, ex, at quote unquote expensive 11 to 13 times EBITDA and call it 18 to 25 times EPS, those numbers are now 19 or 20, 17 to 20 times EBITDA and 30 to 40 times EPS. Right. There's such a demand. There's such things. There's such a demand for good businesses um, that can you know, survive volatility and have pricing power and are getting more valuable. Um, and, you know, within a low interest rate world, we've just seen multiples bid up. So it's been really hard for us to, 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 to find a Buffett that you're just willing to say, you know what? I. It, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm going to just hold my nose, and and pay a multiple that's five turns higher than this historical multiple, and because it's getting more valuable every day, just just be okay with writing that out. Um, that th there haven't been that many of those. So let me so so getting to, um, you know, and and honestly, the people who have done that have done a lot better than we have performance wise. <laughs> so again. Being conservative as a value investor can make you look really silly in the short run. But so what I've, I've really found our niche is um, a couple things. One, um, what I call a growth cyclical, a business that is getting more valuable over time, but has some of this because of cyclical end markets. So the TAM is getting larger, the business is getting more valuable, um, but there will be interim periods where you get uh, short-term setbacks and you get to, it, it, we will buy, we don't want to buy secular problems, but we, but we will buy cyclical problems, especially in good businesses. Um, so I found, you know, a, a fair amount of success in buying growth cyclicals. Um, the other way that I've, I've looked at that is looking for businesses that are in transition in some capacity um, and, 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 you know, or, and, and yeah, let's, let's start with that one. So a business where the capital allocation has changed, whether they've done a divestment, where they've gotten rid of a mediocre business, or where they've bought something that changed the, the, the growth and return trajectory of the company, and it's just not yet recognized, right? So people on, on our, on our um, you know, Buffett-Graham uh, spectrum, where a one is a true Buffett and a four is a true Graham, people are underwriting a three, which would be a mediocre business. But actually, the capital allocation changes that have been made it's, have made it a two, which is more of a buffet. And if you can find a business um, for which um, the earnings and cash flow trajectory uh, is better than people thought, um, you can do really well because what you're going to get is you're going to get the double whammy of better numbers and a higher multiple. So find a business that's in transition. Um, it's getting more valuable every day. Your contrarian perception is that there's been a capital allocation change that has caused that. Well, and other people are slow to recognize that. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more. And this, this, this kind of goes back to Lumen, um, where if you go back to this slide, um, you know, you can see that we think the level three business and the company thinks the level three business is worth a fair amount. And the CenturyLink business, which is the legacy, um, basically what, what you call wireline um, to, you know, the old, the old school telephone business is not worth a whole lot given those multiples. Um, and so the other thing to do is find a good business hiding, 
you know, kind of attached to a mediocre business um, where some kind of uh, capital allocation change, spin, sale, divestiture, something causes the value of the uh, more attractive business to be highlighted. Um, and, you know, Lumens just announced that they're going to have an investor day in two weeks. I am, hate to say it out loud, but I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to hear something about a capital allocation or, um, you know, company split or change. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too optimistic. But if you just look at the discrepancy in terms of the multiples that these two businesses trade at, it would be suggestive. Uh, you know, or, or it would be suggestive of the fact that they, they are considering doing something to highlight the value of the level three assets. So um, great question, Kelly. I, I don't, I really wish I could say that um, we've been able to buy a bunch of high quality, super buffety businesses at reasonable multiples um, and just ride the wave but they've been so expensive that it's kind of forced us to find things where you can employ more of a contrarian perspective in kind of the three examples I gave you. Great, thanks. Um, so let's, let's finish this, this discussion of valuation. Um, you know, it was pretty quick, but I think I gave you a good overview of, 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 how, we, of how we think about an uh, valuation. So, um, Again, you want multiple metrics that suggest undervaluation. Um, if one, as I said, if one doesn't scream as being cheap, um, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a deal breaker. As I said, our DCF is incredibly <laughs> conservative. So every once in a while, you'll see something fairly valued on DCF and really undervalued on the other things. You know, that's, we're okay with that. Um, but make sure that you're consistent in your assumptions across your techniques. Don't use a low growth rate and a high whack in the DCF and then a high, you know, EBITDA multiple or EPS multiple. That's inconsistent, right? Make sure that if you were saying that this company deserves a high multiple, make sure that your, that your assumptions in the DCF are reflective of that, right? Is it margins? Is it returns? Is it, is it growth rate? Is it, a, is it a whack? Well, how do you want to do that? But make sure you're consistent. Um, and you can use your DCF to test your assumptions. Um, and so going back to, I can just, just quickly go back here and say, um, well, look at the current stock price. If, if it's fair, that um, an eight percent, if an eight percent whack is, is is fair for for Western Union, then you know the market is 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 incorporating a minus three percent notepad growth. So is and, and then you can go back and you say, okay, is that is that reasonable or unreasonable? I think that's unreasonable, and so that's one of the reasons we own it. So you can you can kind of reverse go go backwards and, and say, okay, well here's my assumptions. Here's the sensitivity box. Um, Let's you know plug in different growth rates and different wax, and you can kind of see what the what what the current stock is implying. Um, and if you're seeing that you know to get, get based on your assumptions to 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 get to the current stock price, um, you know the, the the company has to grow its notepad at eleven percent. Um, you know you really you 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 have to either really adjust your assumptions, or what you're doing is validating the market. You know thinks very highly of this company at the current time. Um, if, um, think about it this way. If you're too conservative with any of these analyses, you miss opportunities. And I'll tell you one thing, and you know, I'm sorry if, if this breaks your heart as young investors, but you are gonna miss so many things in your career. And you have to be okay with that. There's thousands of publicly traded companies. There are going to be things that, that happen that were not on your spreadsheet, that were not on anyone's spreadsheet that are both good and bad. And there are going to be stocks that you were very lukewarm about that just you know, go up five or 10 times because something changed and or you misunderstood, as George Bush would say, you know, something that happened. Or, or that, so I, I, you know, I think you have to be really comfortable with the fact that you're not going to, A, you're not going to be right all the time when you invest, and you're going to have to be comfortable missing things. Um, 
but if you're and if, but if you're too bullish in your assumptions or your multiples or your analysis, that's when you lose money. And and I'm a Buffett style investor that says that you know the first rule is don't lose money, and the second rule is don't forget the first rule. So you know if you're conservative, you're going to miss things, um, but if you're bullish, you're going to lose money. And so I would rather I would rather miss things um, and not be too bullish um, than being really bullish and, and, and losing money for our clients. And so not everyone's going to have that same frame, but that's, that's really how I operate. Um, and in general, you, you just, you want a, a sufficient margin of safety for the risk you're taking. If there's, if the security is super complex and 10 things have to go right for you to make money and, you know, you're really conscious, you're really cautious about the management team. Like you really should have a huge margin of safety. So calibrate the margin of safety with the quality of the opportunity. If business and value and people are really lining up, then maybe you don't need a huge margin of safety. But if, if, oh, if some of those are lacking, really say to yourself, you know, I, I, need a, I need a large margin of safety from the valuation to be able to put money to work here. And getting to Kelly's point, you, you, know, you, you need to develop a contrarian thesis on why the market is wrong at the current valuation. If you can't articulate something different from what the sell side or other buy side investors are saying, then, 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 then you don't have an edge. And, you, you, and, and if you don't have an edge, it's not something that you should be investing in. So you know, develop an edge through your research, but also have a, a, a very um, articulate reason for why you think the current stock price is wrong and the current consensus is wrong. Um, so decision-making, let me go quickly through this because how does this, so, so you may be asking, you know, in terms of context, like how does this, all of this, both the qualitative and the quantitative stuff I've talked about, how does it end up in a decision? So let me, I'm going to pose a couple of questions, right? That which, which, which is probably, which have probably crossed your mind is like, as a firm, do you overweight the stock that trades at the largest discount, right? So you overweight your cheapest stocks, or do you overweight the stock with the least downside? Kind of a margin of safety, downside protection oriented um, um, strategy. As, as, as I think you can heard from me, like I'm very downside focused. Um, so I'm really looking for situations where business value and people align. Um, I want all three of our pillars to be in alignment. And even if, um, if we really like the value, sorry, the business and the people and the value is only okay, I'm okay with having an overweight. I don't necessarily need a huge margin of safety if the, if, if the business and the people are really good. Um, but there are other combinations that, that are, I, am, I am very concerned about. Um, if, if just the business and the value are good and I don't like the people, that's a deal breaker for me. That's just a, I'm, I'm not going to invest with people I don't trust. Um, if, if any of you are interested, the class, um, the class I guest lectured for, uh, for Bill Simon's class is on management, assessing management and capital allocation. So if anyone's interested in that um, um, uh, presentation, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, that's a, it's long one, it's like 60 slides. Um, Bill's classes are pretty long, um, but it is really all about our process of assessing management, capital allocation and, the, and board of directors. Um, and so people are a huge part of our process. And if, and if the people, um, if the people aren't good, I, I just, I really think, um, you know, I, I think it, it, they don't get anywhere near enough, it, that, 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 that process of evaluating management doesn't get anywhere near enough press or discussion among the buy side or the sell side. Um, but I, I think you should, you, you should, um, have a very high bar for the people you're willing to partner with. Let's just put it that way. And, and, and kind of on a corollary to that is if, um, if it's only, if the only thing that's interesting is the value, right? Like the people are okay and the business is okay. And it's just really, really cheap. You know, that used to be really like something that would be interesting to me um, as a Ben Graham investor. But today um, I, I'm, I don't want things that are just cheap. I'm looking for the combination. Um, and so the, the way we, we mitigate risk and is by position sizing. So if, it, if we really like the people and the value or the people in the business and one of the three legs of the stool is missing, you know, we're okay in a half position, right? So it, maybe the business is getting more valuable than, than we thought, or maybe the people are a question mark, but at the end of the day, like, you know, these people turn out to be outsiders. Right. Then then you can, you know, maybe move into a full position. But if one of those pillars is, is a question mark, you can invest in a half position. 
Um, and so let me close this section on, on ESG. Um, you know, it's a very hot topic. There's a lot of money being raised for ESG. Um, I think, unfortunately, in our industry, any place where there's money going into, people do fair, you know, do things that are just based on raising assets and marketing and maybe even do disingenuous things to raise money. Um, so we're not trying to participate in an ESG craze. Um, you know, I, I am a, I, 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 I care deeply uh, about, um, especially the environment side. Um, but, um, you know, and, and my wife is writing a book on social sustainability. So you can imagine the conversations we have in, in, in this household. Um, but, but the way I look at ESG and all of this stuff is that there's no good ENS without good G. Everything starts with people and the people at the top set the tone. So without good corporate governance, you're not going to get companies that care about ENS or, and do it right. So good management teams anticipate changes and invest for the long run. And that's, you know, that's when it comes to acquisitions, when it comes to, you know, any kind of capital allocation, but it also, you know, it includes risk management. So for, for, for me, um, you know, the, the, you want people who are focused on the in the, in the S side um, and they, you want them to be so focused on it that it starts to trickle down to the rest of the culture. Um, so for, from, from my perspective, start with good corporate governance and then everything else um, is, you know, will fall in place. Um, so I, I've, um, I've included this um, and I will, I'll give you the caveat. This is, this is, this is a Ben specific set of questions. Um, I will just say my colleagues don't necessarily share my concerns uh, and, and, and process associated with, with the kind of the environmental side. And, um, but I did want to share this with you because this is, these are questions I always ask myself. Um, so um, you can see the list here. Um, and what I do is I, I score this and I say, you know, if, if, if I ask myself these 10 questions and if it's, um, you know, five or more, um, I start to get really nervous about whether or not this company may be in a, an, in a inopportune position. If, if the world, if, if the climate continues to change. Um, and, and let me say a few things about this. So if you see a lot of yeses to these questions, you know, a cheap valuation may not be enough to protect you from these issues. Um, you may have to start to question the longevity of the company itself or the returns on capital. Um, you're going to start to wonder if management has done enough. Um, is that through capital ca allocation? Is that through risk management? And so in terms of this analysis, um, it's really a red flag analysis. It's really just another part of our process or my personal process to, you know, to just assess the full, the holistic, the company from a holistic basis. And again, less is more. So that's fewer new ideas, fewer stocks in the portfolio, have a high hurdle rate for stocks to get into the portfolio. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking for red flags. And if I see some environmental red flags, you know, I'm going to be more hesitant. Um, and so, you know, this is, you, know, you, you don't want to be too dogmatic about something because there's, you know, the world is probabilistic and a lot of things can happen. But if you're seeing a lot of, whether it's concerns about management or concerns about the environment or concerns about capital allocation, you know, those should be red flags that, that, that make you think twice about the investment. Um, and I will say, and I, as I mentioned, you know, ESG is a hot space. Um, so just about everybody is now coming out with, you know, environmental and sustainability reports and co corporate social responsibility projects and stuff like that. I think there's a lot of greenwashing out there, which means that a bunch of consultants have told companies they have to talk about this stuff and it's not actually part of the culture um, and the management doesn't actually care about it. They've just been told by BlackRock and, and ISS and the, you know, the consultants that they spend millions of dollars on that they have to talk about it. So when you think about ESG and you think about when you start to see companies uh, discussing it more, look more deeply into what than, than, than the, just what's being said. Um, so let me do a couple of takeaways and then we'll, we'll jump into, um, to Q and a, um, so, um, the, the first one is you, you can, you can become a, a buy side analyst, even if you don't take a traditional path. Um, I think I am living proof of that. Um, I, I, I love what I do. I tap dance to work. Um, this is something I'm passionate about. Um, and you know, I didn't start my career as, as, as an, as a value investor. So, um, you know, remember that, especially when you're just graduating from college, 
you know, your life can change any number of times in between your age and my age and, you know, be open to different paths um, and, and don't put yourself in a box and say, this is the only way I can get there. Um, you know, find a way to distinguish yourself from others. Stand out, you know, find something that's special about you that you can communicate in an articulate fashion that is impressive to a potential employer. Um, value in companies is an imperfect science. So be conservative and use multiple methodologies. Um, and then in terms of ESG, it's a really important thing to consider, I think, especially now, um, given that investors care more about it, companies care more about it, um, and, um, you know, it, whatever, the, 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 the climate appears to be changing. And um, if, if, if the, George, the post-George Floyd era is, is evidence of anything, the social stuff is gonna be more and more in focus. Um, and so it's something to understand and consider but my sense is that you start with corporate governance, understand the people you're partnering with and how they think about ESG from a holistic basis and move from there. Um, and here's my email address. Anybody um, who's interested in seeing the presentation that we give to, that I give to Bill Simon's class, please email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy. Um, and with that, uh, I believe we have a few minutes for continued Q&A. Um, this is more of a smaller one. It seems like the sum of the parts valuation can only really apply to larger companies. If you wanted to use, it, if you were valuing a smaller, like really straightforward company that only six to one industry, would you substitute in another method? So that's a good question. And so really what that does is you're combining the private market value with the sum of the parts. So if it only has one segment, what you're doing is you're looking for comps, either um, you know existing companies that, that trade on public exchanges or or presidential multiples. So it's it's basically the combination of the two. You're just you're just it's not a sum of the parts anymore. You're just you're just trying to figure out looking at looking at historical multiples, look uh, of, of of presidential transactions and 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 where the comps trade. Um, you can get a sense of excuse me what the um, what the company would could potentially sell for. But you still have to go through this whole process of figuring out, is it better or is it worse? Is it smaller? Does that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does that mean it's subscale and the margins are lower? But does that, on the flip side, does that also mean that the company can rip out a ton of costs um, and scale the business? So there are, you know, there again, this is the art to it, right? It, no two companies are exactly the same. No previous transaction if it's exactly with the company you're looking at. And so you have to, again, be conservative in your assessment of, of, of where this company fits within that framework. Um, so uh, it's a good question, but think of it as, as just a, you, you just change the name. It's, it's more of a private market value. Yeah, and just, just to go off that, um, I, I found really interesting on the bottom, it says strategic versus private equity. Um, acquire, um, does that have to do with like the premiums, like liquidity premiums? So like, I know sometimes private equity, they'll have a discount um, on an acquisition. Is that is that how you would apply it for the like precedent comps? Well, the way to think about it is that a strategic acquirer has the ability to extract synergies in ways that most private equity companies can't. Now, if the private equity company is, 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 is combined Combining, the private equity firm is combining the, the company in question with one of its portfolio companies, then there, there, is, there are potential, potential synergies and you know, they can pay a slightly higher multiple than someone who couldn't use those synergies. Um, so that's really what you're doing is that in theory, a pure financial buyer um, is willing to pay a lower multiple than would a, a strategic who can extract synergies. And so that's really what you're looking at. And it's if you're saying to yourself, well, um, you know, what would a private equity firm pay for this versus, you know, what would a strategic pay? I think you can almost always assume the strategics will pay more because they're always in a better position. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Appreciate that.
I just wanted to say thank you for presenting to us. This was all super interesting and I learned a lot from you. Great. Um, I, I hope it was helpful. Thank you for listening. I just wanted to chime in and say thank you as well. Uh, very uh, insightful, especially with the uh, futuristic outlooks. Well, um, I mean, uh, going after Howard Marks is a very, very tall <laughs> and difficult task. Thank Kelly. Thanks for thanks for 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 setting the bar so high. Um, but I do hope that you know my you know my story plus our you know kind of quirky brand of evaluating companies and 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 looking at companies is is instructive. And I thought you did a wonderful presentation. And um, I saw that you put at the end your your email. Is it all right if the students email you like, you know, other questions or things they might have or sure, they might yeah, even want to show you like a DCF or something or, you know, I mean, they may dive deeper into some of the things you talked about. Um, you know, a lot of the methodologies you use, I used as well when I was uh, practicing in the business and um, I, I, I like your approach. And I think it's very thoughtful. I've always uh, agreed that fewer is actually better. Uh, fewer ideas, but better ideas yeah. has been pretty much the mantra of most places I've worked. Um, so very similar to kind of how your thought process works. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I mean, I, again, like, um, <laughs> you know, I've got a lot on my plate at all times, but I do take time um, when people email me, I might not get back to you immediately, um, but, you know, feel free to email me if you have questions. Um, and, and look, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I like to help people. Um, I've, I've had a lot of people help me in my career. Um, and I've had, a, you know, I've had some mentors um, and I've had a lot of people do things for me, you know, com just completely out of kindness. So I, I like to, um, I like to be both an inspiration and, um, you know, uh, uh, some guy and provide guidance for people who are trying to navigate the, through this. So please, um, you know, whether it's based on valuation or based on my career, or, you know, things that you can do to distinguish yourself, feel free to reach out and just, just remember that, um, you know, a <laughs> lot going on in my life. I have a, also a 15 month old baby. So life, life is complex in a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm happy to help to the degree that I can find the bandwidth. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Uh, any other comments or questions for Ben? I just want to thank you for uh, your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. Um, thanks for thanks for taking the time to listen. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for talking.